The Wild Turkey, one of 10 birds featured in a new book I highly recommend for Thanksgiving and any other time of the year. 10 Birds That Changed the World. Stephen Moss is the author, a distinguished author, an environmentalist, television producer for the BBC Natural History Unit, and here to take us to the legend and the facts of the wild turkey. Stephen, a very good evening to you. Your book is a joy, and we're going to follow you through history and across the continents. But we begin with the wild turkey because I am familiar here in New England. The wild turkey has reestablished itself. You have some wonderful numbers to say how it's come back with protection and habitat being protected in some fashion. The wild turkey was discovered when Europeans came to America. The wild turkey certainly is a much more capable than given credit. It's 2.5 to 5.4 kilograms, and it lives in mixed forests. What did Europe make of the wild turkey when it first heard about this? And uh, what did they make of the fact that the Americans, over that course of the 18th century, decided to make the turkey a major piece of our of our legend? So much so that it was almost, if this apocryphal is correct, our national bird. Good evening to you, Stephen. Good evening, John. An absolute privilege and pleasure to be here. Well, the turkey, like all the birds in in my book, 10 Birds That Changed the World, the turkey has an extraordinary history through time, through culture. Um, It's a bird that, of course, is most familiar to Americans for Thanksgiving and to Americans and the British and Europeans as a bird we eat at Christmas. Um, And... Yet, of course, many, I think many people, particularly in Britain, probably don't realise that there is a wild version of the turkey, you know, that it's a real species. And as you say, it was discovered, um, rediscovered, of course, by the Europeans who came to the Americas. It's obviously very well known to the um, people who were already there. And it was a bird that was both taken back to Europe to be eaten but also the pilgrims, what we used to call the pilgrim fathers, but of course men and women, um, it's quite possible, I argue in the book, that they wouldn't have survived the first winter after landing uh, with the Mayflower had it not been for their ability to go and catch and kill and cook and eat wild turkeys. The domestication of the turkeys reaches into the Americas prehistory. But if I understand correctly, the two versions did not survive. One did from southern Mexico, the southern Mexican turkey. So all the turkeys in North America, all the turkeys in the Americas come from that one line. Is that correct, Steve? That's correct. And and as you say, it was a bird that was initially actually worshipped by um, the, the many civilizations of of Central America and the southern part of what we now call North America. Um, But it was a bird that was also, of course, eaten because you can't really have a bird like that (laughs) that's so plump and so tasty without people deciding eventually to eat it. But initially it was kept really as a, as really, I suppose, a a bird to be worshipped and honoured because it is a magnificent bird. The expectation is that Columbus is the first one to eat the turkey and uh, report it uh, successful. This is through the 15th, 16th century, but I want to come up to the confusion of the the word turkey. It never occurred to me before I read your book to ask this question. How did it get to be named for a country in Asia Minor? Well, you're right. It's that way round. It's not that the country is named after the bird. Many, many things are named after birds, of course. Um, But that's absolutely one where a bird from the Americas brought to Europe as food and as a domesticated bird um, was named after the country. And it was partly because Turkey in, in 16th, 17th century Britain was considered a very exotic place. There was a lot of trade with what we would then called Asia Minor, which was that sort of western part of Asia, on the borders with Europe. And Turkey was a very strong trading nation. And I think there was just some confusion that birds were brought in. Guinea fowls, which are actually an African species, 
were sometimes called turkeys. And the name stuck. It's a very inappropriate name, of course, but that's true of many bird names. Um, so where the turkeys came from wasn't a concern when they named it. It was that items that came from outside of Britain were presumed to be brought here by Turkish merchants or from right. place Turkey. So they called it Turkey. They uh, had a, a bird called the guinea fowl. They already called Turkey. So they yes. just put them together. Yes. And the guinea fowl then stopped being called Turkey. Um, guinea fowl, of course, Guinea is a, um, a land in West Africa, you know, place in West Africa. But again, guinea fowls are found all over africa i mean i wrote a book on bird names a few years ago which is published in america it's called mrs moreau's warbler how birds get their names and what you learn is that bird names are entirely illogical there is no logic to most bird names you know like you have the american robin but it's not a robin it's a thrush right i i, I read that i want it's not so i looked it up it's not it's not a robin so yeah. What am I going to do next spring when I welcome the Robins? I'm going to say, you guys are going under a false title. You're thrushes. Now, now that we've taken on the turkey, and it's a very smart bird. I've witnessed it take on my Springer Spaniel and, his, and not only lead him away from the chicks, but also fly. And he was amazed. I don't think he'll chase a turkey again. We come to the American eagle, which is not the official bird of America. But at the same time, it has habits that are not appetizing. What are those, Stephen? Well, it's a scavenger. It's not entirely a scavenger. Like a lot of birds of prey, it, 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 it will take advantage of scavenging. Of course, they will catch things like salmon in Alaska as well. Um, and it's a bird that Benjamin Franklin, no less, one, one of the greatest American statesmen, um, argued that, in fact, it shouldn't be the national bird of America, the official bird, that should go to the turkey because the turkey is an honourable bird and, and a smart bird. Um, we never quite know with Benjamin Franklin whether the letter from which this comes to his daughter, whether he was actually joking. You know, it may have been he was being humorous, but it's, again, another story that's gone down in history. And, of course, the bald eagle may not be officially um, the national bird. Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. But it's clearly enormously influential to American culture and society. It's, you know, on dollar bills. It's it's on every um, embassy and high commission of America throughout the world has the seal showing, great seal showing the American bald eagle. And it's a very smart and, and impressive bird. Uh, and of course, it's a bird that signifies power. Eagles throughout history, whatever the species, signify power to people like the romans um the greeks you know this goes on through history you make the very convincing point however it's associated with sinister forces begins with rome that the aquilifer the man who carried the eagle standard at the front of the legions uh that was after they'd been wiped out i believe uh and they had to come back together with some important branding the eagle represented absolute predatory power. Rome was not going to deal with you generously. That's and, right. and is that what the subsequent civilizations made of the eagle? I'm looking at the Holy Roman Empire. I'm looking at Napoleon, Napoleon's eagle. Did he want it to also represent something sinister? I think they want it to represent power. And of course, power can be benevolent. But quite often it isn't benevolent or maybe it starts as a benevolent thing. But once you start conquering um, and creating empires, as, of course, Napoleon did and, 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 and the Holy Roman Empire, it starts becoming slightly more sinister. And of course, the, until recently, the most sinister example of the eagle, um, any eagle rather than simply the bald eagle, being used as a symbol of power was the Nazis. Hitler appropriated the Holy Roman eagle but he changed it so that when you're looking at the image of the bird, instead of looking left as we look at it, it looks right as we look at it. And this was the idea that it was, for someone looking at the symbol, it looked like it was looking towards Russia, which Hitler wanted to conquer. And so the eagle, along with the swastika, became a very um, important symbol for the Nazis. The eagle is 
right now a choice by America as well. It's in our language. It's in everything about it not being official. I I have no way of checking that. Does the Congress know that? I mean, I, I because everybody thinks it's everybody thinks it's official, Stephen. But it was. It was. It was. It was taken on by Congress um, as a symbol of america so it's i suppose it's the official symbol yeah in the great seal that remember you said they were so exhausted coming up with a design they could all accept when the final one came and it had an eagle in it they go okay yeah it it seemed like exhaustion in 17 that was 1782 right before the peace was made so they were, were tired already i'm speaking with stephen moss we started with two american like birds we have bald eagles Bald eagles have made a wonderful comeback in Alaska. At one point, they were in distress. And one of the salient points in Stephen's book that comes back and back is extinction, the word extinction. We're going to turn to another bird that is associated with America and Europe at the same time. Consider the humble pigeon. This is Stephen Moss's book, 10 Birds That Changed the World. We turn to the humble pigeon everywhere in New York. In fact, they're everywhere in Connecticut and everywhere in New England in some form because they've taken very well to America. They urbanize as well as survive in rural America. But you make a very excellent case that pigeons have a skill set that has been fundamental to success, communication, saving people's lives. Good heavens. Uh, the, The pigeon has a skill that is... To my knowledge, it doesn't seem to fit any other bird. It always must go home through rain and storm. It's the ultimate mailman. <laughs> That's right. It's the great communicator. And and I mean, the pigeons are very, very paradoxical, but because this is the feral pigeon, as we call it, or the, you know, we call them the London pigeon or the, you know, other maybe you call it the New York pigeon, you know, but this is... They are wild birds in a sense, but they descend from wild birds which were captured, captured and domesticated and then have escaped and gone feral. So they're not a bird that, for example, birders pay a lot of attention to. We don't like pigeons very much, a lot of birders. They, you know, they don't put them on their lists. And yet this bird, as you say, although it was originally domesticated for food uh, and possibly the use of its feathers and things, but mainly food, um, it was soon discovered that they have this extraordinary skill, which, of course, a lot of birds migrate. A lot of birds can find their way to a place the other side of the world and back home to the area where they were born. But pigeons have been bred through time to be exceptionally good at this. And they are the great communicators. Yes, the examples you give are are both uh, astonishing. And at the same time, there's some myth here. I, the one I love is uh, Rothschild. The Rothschild bankers, Nathan Rothschild is in London. It's 1815, June of 1815. Yes, yes, what's he talking about? Waterloo, of course. And the wonderful story is the reason the Rothschilds were able to sell their shares and then and bend them, buy them back cheap is because a pigeon was released on the battlefield of Waterloo and made it home to London in time for Rothschild to buy and sell. Is that accurate, Stephen? No, it's it's another myth, but it's based on accuracy. They certainly tried to do this. I think they had human messengers as well. But what is true is that pigeons often can, particularly in war zones, times particularly in the First World War and the Second World War, pigeons are able to get back quicker than any other means. Um, now, if you think about it, for example, in D-Day, when the, the Americans came and joined forces with the, the British and the Allies to invade continental Europe and to finally defeat the Nazis in 1944, you couldn't use radios because the Nazis didn't know the attack was coming. So they had to have radio silence. So when the ships, you know, we've seen it in films like Saving Private Ryan, when they landed on the Normandy beaches, pigeons were released to take the message back home that they'd they'd landed successfully which was absolutely crucial um you know in winning that part of the war that saved the, the democratic world um likewise you know in the first world war there was a pigeon called cher ami which is still in i think the national museum of american history i think it's called is that right in washington yes um, and That's this right. pigeon yeah. 
which lacks it's only got it's a stuffed version of it of course it's only got i think one eye and one leg and this is a bird that was released by a commander of a new york battalion who accidentally and almost tragically had strayed behind the lines and so they were being um shelled by their own army with you know what's terribly called friendly fire and he released various pigeons to try to get them back and they all got shot and the final one Jeremy reached the men who were doing the shelling just in time for them to stop and saved a large quantity of 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 ordinary soldiers and these stories are incredible you know the, the fact that pigeons are still used for communication in places in the world and of course the difference between a human um, and a pigeon is you can't you can't have a double agent pigeon you know pigeons pigeons can't be turned <laughs> and, uh, and also you know they can often get somewhere where any kind of machine or human being might be captured or might all right let's go to the 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 Pigeon wars between the Third Reich and the United Kingdom, because oh, there, there, there's a predator that the pigeons must fear, the peregrine falcon, peregrine falcon, which can fly right. 240 miles per hour. Who trained them? Well, what happened was the pigeons were um, trained and released to fly back and forth across the channel, taking messages. And unfortunately, they were being killed by wild peregrine falcons, peregrine falcons feed on any birds but pigeons are one of their favorites and that's true in the united states and back in britain even today and so what happened was that a group of british soldiers were sent out a, a crack force to kill the peregrines because they were you know messages were being lost by these you know the peregrines killing the pigeons and that actually led along with the use of ddt which of course you know stories in Britain and America are often in parallel after the war to the peregrine, not quite almost going extinct, but becoming extremely rare and endangered until they finally made a comeback. So they've, you know, they've come back. They've, they've come back. The good news. The book, Christmas, yeah. 10 birds that changed the world. We're headed to, we come to a myth that I grew up with. Everybody else grew up with and the BBC reinforced in 1979, 1978 with some, spectacular presentations I watched as a younger person. I remember the 20th century. Stephen Moss is with me, the author of the new book, 10, book, Ten Birds That Changed the World. This changed my life and now he's changed it back again. It has to do with the Galapagos Islands where I've never been, but my daughter happily went there and tells me the finches are doing fine. However, those finches, and the myth of Darwin, well, I'll tell it quickly because Stephen's gonna correct the record. The story I had was that Darwin, on the voyage of the Beagle, arrived at the Galapagos and observed taking notes of all the different birds on the different Galapagos islands and how they were different. The bills were bigger or smaller. The colors were different. And came up with the idea that the reason they're different is because they evolved to fit the circumstances, the weather, the food patterns, and they're isolated. They can't easily travel to the mainland. That was what I grew up with. And now, Stephen, the facts are astonishing. I think Darwin mentioned finches once, curious finches. That's about it, right? So how did we get the story? That's right, in the origin of species. Well, of course, as you say, it is absolutely true that a bird from the mainland, probably from South America, we think, arrived on the Galapagos, there were all these, there weren't very many other small birds, there were lots of different micro habitats and niches, ecological niches, and that bird did evolve into these very different looking birds, as you say, different sized bills, different way they feed, and um, all that's true. Darwin's finches are a brilliant example of Darwin's theory. The only problem is Darwin didn't realise it. So what happened was that he collected the birds, as you say. He forgot to label which island he'd found them on, which made them not very, yeah, you know, wasn't very helpful. He took them back to a man called John Gould, who was the curator of birds at the British Museum for Natural History in London and a, a very famous artist in his own right. Um, and he said to Gould, well, these are obviously birds from different families. There's some grosbeaks and some perhaps some tanagers and, you know, 
uh, finches, you know, he came up warblers, you know, he came up with these different ideas that they were not related. Gould took one look at them and said, actually, I think you're wrong. I think they are related. And But even then, even when Darwin knew that they must be related and therefore descended from a common ancestor, he chose, ironically, to use pigeons as his main example of how birds evolve, because, of course, pigeons are bred in captivity, so he could work out the genetics of them. Um, nor were Darwin's finches called Darwin's finches until about 100 years after he was born. In fact, it was when they were celebrating his centenary, long after he died. This is by now the early 20th century. Um, and someone decided to call them Darwin's finches. So we have this irony that they are a brilliant example of evolution by natural selection that Darwin proposed, but he never really realised that. At the same time, the Galapagos become what looks like a stairway to modern science. A man named David Lack, spends, the father of evolutionary ecology, spends much time in the Galapagos studying the finches. And yet it's not until the 20th and 21st century, uh, with the advance of DNA, we get some clarity here. I want to give credit to everybody, but it was a, as I understand it, this is generation after generation returning to what was presumed to be the breakthrough moment. And yet the people who are returning, we depend upon them in the 20th century, their work uh, much more than Darwin's the big, the big window for everybody to stare into, but inside the building are all these really diligent people. Let's... That's a very good image. That's a lovely uh, image. And, and Peter and Rosemary Grant, I think, are the great Uns, well, not unsung heroes of this story, because there's an excellent book about them uh, called The Beak of a Finch, written by um, the science writer Jonathan, um, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, I think it's uh, Vina or Vina. Um, and Peter and Rosemary are an English couple, but they have worked all their lives at Princeton University. And they went out to the Galapagos and realised, when, ironically, when El Nino happened and changed the climate temporarily, as it's happening this year, that the birds were having to adapt much more quickly than we thought, for example, to a year of drought with no rain. And so they discovered that. So I think, you know, Darwin is a great man and people followed in his footsteps. But as you say, there are some great British and American scientists who have really proven, if you like, his theories. Now the music comes up because this is dramatic. It is not just the size of the beaks. It's not just the weather or El Nino. Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge discover something that is astonishing at the time. It still is. It has to do with the speed of evolution. What is it, Stephen? Well, what it was, was people always thought that evolution happened gradually over many, many millennia. Um, particularly for larger organisms such as birds and mammals. And yet what Eldridge and, and Gould showed and what Peter and Rosemary Grant also therefore proved was that you get long periods where very little happens in evolution. But then if conditions change dramatically, birds and other creatures can evolve very, very quickly in the matter of a few, you know, literally a couple of years rather than millennia. And I think that was something that was not known until I think it was the late 70s, early 1980s, where they came up with these ideas. So, you know, we're learning about the natural world all the time. And Darwin's finches are a, a fascinating example. Um, I, too, have not been to the Galapagos, but it's on my list. The Galapagos are a laboratory. And it's a laboratory with history, but I'm off to Australia. I do a deal of reporting in Australia. And I've learned that everything in Australia that's an animal or a bird is exotic and will try to kill you. Okay, so we're talking about an unusual gathering. The kangaroo will punch you in the face and he's bigger than you. And so we're going to go to the magpie because I've learned that the magpie, especially breeding season, which is right now, is a danger to human beings. You best wear a bicycle helmet when you come near a magpie's nest, even though you won't know it. But it turns out that the magpie and the willy wagtail, all of them are examples of 
evolution to the environment. Do I say that correctly? These birds are... Yeah, uh, that, that's right. They're, it's, well, also, it's convergent evolution. The names themselves, again, rather like the American robin was named by homesick Brits who turned up in America and saw a bird with a red breast and said, well, we're not seeing any robins here, so let's call that one a robin. Exactly the same is true. Australian magpie is not a magpie. It's not a crow. It's not a member of the crow family, as, as the Eurasian magpie uh, or indeed magpies in America are. Um, and the woolly wagtails the same. You know, these are these are families that are only found in Australasia. Um, and again, you know, they've evolved. I mean, it's a complicated story. And there's another wonderful book called Where Song Began by an Australian writer called Tim Lowe, which I'd highly recommend that I quote in this book, um, that, you know, often what we think we see when we see birds isn't true. You know, it, it, it's, I suppose that one of the messages of this book is that birds are more mysterious than we think. They, they, they do things that surprise us constantly. And I think that's an important thing that we should think about with this book. The magpie is not a crow family, correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. But the magpie has a reputation of being extremely smart and remembering who you are and holding it against you if you come near his nest very calm. So when it comes to bird intelligence, I got a little lost. I kept finding intelligence in all of your birds. I didn't find a stupid bird here, Stephen. It's interesting. People have often thought pigeons were stupid. Um, and, they're, you know, they're obviously deeply intelligent. Crows, corvids, uh, we're going to come on later in the, the you know this discussion to the raven they are probably the most intelligent group of birds of course parrots are also extremely intelligent but all birds have levels of intelligence they 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 can all learn things and they can then apply that learning and that's well, a, that that mother wild turkey that led my my springer spaniel away from the chicks that was smart that's intelligence yeah it, it's instinct and intelligence your intelligence can be measured in lots of different ways, but just because it's instinctive doesn't mean it's not intelligent. She could have turned and fought him, but she took the better course because she had this method that he didn't know about, which is if she can fly. And that was it. So I I, I learned from your book, not only to respect these different versions of, and often misnamed versions of birds, but also to assume that they know what they're doing that they're living wild and I'm coming across them, a, a, a domesticated creature, and I haven't learned the forest or the woods or the desert the way they learn. I think that's a very good point. Absolutely. Magpies do not retreat. They may they put their nests where they want to, whether it's in a residential area or not. And if you come close to them, they let you know this is not what you want to do today. We're going to turn to another bird that is important to understand the concept that is throughout Stephen's book, it's the version that we understand as extinction. 10 Birds That Changed the World, Stephen Moss's new book. He's also a producer, but the author of a book that reveals to me again and again, language is important. And the word extinction is frightening. How many extinctions have there been since the creation of the earth in the bombardment of three and a half to four, four billion years ago? But this one, the dodo bird turns out to be the, the author of the word extinction that enters into the vocabulary of the century since he was first discovered. I believe it was the 16th century when a ship called there. And the dodo no longer exists, but the word extinction is now important for those who move to save or protect or in some way uh, worry about the habitats and the destruction of our birds. The humble dodo, I learned from you that when the Dutch first found him, they called him the wallow birds, and they regarded him as loathsome. What happened to him? Why did why did they go away on the Mauritius Islands suddenly, Stephen? Well, what I hadn't realized um, about the dodo was that unlike other oceanic islands that were colonized by humans during the sort of age of empire, if you like, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, Mauritius was not inhabited by people. So unlike America, unlike New Zealand, unlike Australia, where there were you know, humans were there already, Mauritius 
was a place where the dodo lived and it had evolved not to have to fly because why would it have to fly if there's no enemies and there were also no predators no no ground predators no mammals and unfortunately the dutch sailors who arrived i think in 1597 or 98 brought in dogs and cats and rats and actually macaque monkeys which they kept as pets and those birds both ate the eggs and the chicks of the dodo in the nest but also of course could catch the um, flightless adults unlike your turkey it couldn't fly away and the dodo was extinct within about 80 years you can never of course tell when the very last individual dies out but the last reliable sighting is towards the end of the 17th century around 1680 the concept of extinction doesn't really exist at this point because at that point society in the west is extremely religious extremely christian and the idea that the creator might create species and then allow them to go extinct was simply incomprehensible to people and it actually took another 50 to 100 years for during the enlightenment for people to argue that some creatures had indeed gone extinct so it's great irony that the dodo no one who knew the dodo alive would ever have understood the idea of extinction and yet it has become the 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 most famous extinct creature of all time george clark 1865 a teacher on the mauritius islands discovers bones in a swamp and that led to in some way to reconstruct a dodo bird whom you thought or it that you thought you met when you went to museum with your mom what did you actually meet stephen well, this was the late 1960s. I would have been seven or eight years old. My mother, um, she was a single parent and she I was the only child. And she would take a week off work every summer and we would go up to London. And the only place I remember going was the Natural History Museum in Kensington, which is still a wonderful place to go. And there was a big um, selection of stuffed birds there. And I was fascinated by birds. So I, I would stand by them for hours. And one of them was a... Um, a stuffed dodo and I remember standing in front of it dodos are quite big they're sort of um probably about three feet tall you know this was a large and slightly terrifying looking bird and it was only many many years later that I discovered that this wasn't a dodo at all it was a model of a dodo made with chicken feathers and and wire and um you know a sort of ceramic bill and 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 plastic eyes you know this is not a real dodo simply because because no one thought this bird could go extinct. They never kept the few they had in museums. They just sort of rotted away. And they always thought the museum owners in Britain and America thought, well, we can always go and get another one. But they did not because by then it was extinct. So, you know, there are very few examples of. You know, and that that one wasn't an example of of a, a real stuffed dodo. I mean, it's still it's still there. I went a year ago and saw it. Um, so, yeah, you know, this is a, a strange story of this bird that has become the the icon of extinction. I think it was Will. Is it Will Cuppy, the American humorist, said it seems to have been invented for the sole purpose of going extinct, which is a very funny line. But um it becomes the emblem of extinction, and there have been successes. You report Professor Carl Jones with the pink pigeon and the Mauritius kestrel, especially the kestrel. He yeah. saved it. He saved it. It could the dodo could have been saved if we'd had a Carl Jones on the scene. That's right. Probably if the dodo had lived, perhaps you know, maybe I don't know. It's hard to do another hundred years. Same is true, of course, of the great orc, of the passenger pigeon, of the Carolina parakeet. These these birds that have gone extinct much more recently in our lifetime. Ivory-billed woodpecker has gone extinct in my lifetime, the others earlier than that. Um, but yes, Carl Jones is a, a, a British, a Welsh scientist, an extraordinary man, who went out to Mauritius. And there, by then, there were several other species, like, as you say, the Mauritius kestrel, very similar to the American kestrel, the European kestrel, a small, uh, elegant falcon. And I think though it was down to a handful, I think maybe 10 or 12 individuals. And he took them into captivity and bred them, made sure the habitat was OK for them, made sure they weren't going to be persecuted and eventually released those back into the wild. And ah, he, used, he used double clutching I have from your report. What is double That's clutching? Right. 
double clutching is basically you you take um a bird from the wild you let it lay eggs and you take the eggs away and when you do that a female bird has the instinct to lay another two or three eggs or whatever her clutch is so that meant they had twice as many eggs then of course you can incubate eggs in um, incubators you don't need a bird to sit on them um so he used all sorts of science and you have to remember this is in the 1970s other scientists were appalled at this they said you know you're wasting your time you're wasting money you're giving hope that's all wrong you know, these birds are doomed and and to be fair they had a point a bird that's down to a dozen individuals it looks like it's doomed it's happened to so many but he wouldn't listen and thank goodness he wouldn't because he brought back a number of species to mauritius and of course we have that opportunity now we have so many birds particularly in the americas and in asia and africa that are on the edge of extinction uh, and we really need an awful lot of carl joneses to bring them back we have a moment here one minute stephen to say that lessons learned the non-native brown rats have been removed to save the lundy seabirds these are islands in the atlantic and the british overseas territory are working to save island birds and make them predator free by 2050 that's right and yeah. that that is a that is a success of the humble dodo bird yeah i think the dodo has inspired us so yes it it went extinct but it, it's its fate has inspired scientists to try to save other species and let's hope they can the book is 10 birds that changed the world and now we turn to a raven I have never seen a raven. I have crows in my life and I respect them. A raven is much bigger. Also, same cleverness, same intelligence, and the legends. Stephen, a very good evening to you. To continue with the raven, you've seen the raven in the Tower of London. I want to start there because that's part of my association. The Tower of London, it's impossible to avoid it if you read English and American history. The raven is a very large bird, and I take it it has something of the the aura of mythology around him. You've met a raven, and he makes a strange sound. Uh, so please explain how big and what the sound is and and what you thought when you met a raven. Uh, ravens are like a crow on steroids. I mean, they're considerably bigger. They're about the same size as a hawk, a buzzard, you know, red-tailed hawk, that sort of size. You know, they're a big bird and they have this very loud, deep call. So they sort of go, oh, oh, oh. It's where they get their name, actually. It's an onomatopoeic name. It's from an old Norse word, grafen. And I've met the ravens at the Tower of London. I've been up close and personal with them, uh, with the raven master, who's a wonderful man there, Chris Scaife, who looks after the ravens. And they have this extraordinary mythology to them. And that mythology goes back to early civilizations, the earliest civilizations in North America, in Scandinavia, in the whole of Northern Asia, Russia, Siberia, all the way around the globe. They are the initial sort of er uh, bird, if you like. And yet, George R. R. Martin, when he wanted to have uh, a bird as his sort of iconic mythical figure in the Game of Thrones, he chooses the ravens. This is a bird that's still relevant today. And in the tower itself, there is a great myth, and it is a myth, like so many stories in this book, they turn out not to be quite true or not to be completely true. And the myth of the ravens in the tower is if they ever leave the tower, the kingdom of the United, you know, the United Kingdom will fall. And yet during the Second World War, when England were fighting the Nazis, in fact, before the Americans came in after Pearl Harbor, the Americans, uh, the tower was bombed and the ravens did leave the tower. There were no ravens at the tower for a few weeks until more could be um, procured. And fortunately, the kingdom did not fall. But I suppose in a way, it's what the raven means to us. You mentioned Edgar Allan Poe, of course, the wonderful poem, The Raven. Um, I think for me, ravens are equal to humans. They're one of the few birds that when you see one, it doesn't look like we're in charge, <laughs> if you see what I mean. You know, they're big, they're frightening. Um, I absolutely love them. I hear them uh, from where I'm sitting now in my office in Somerset in the west of England. 
I will hear a raven flying over and calling. Um, uh, an important detail. The Game of Thrones has used a call that's supposed to be raven. It is a revelation to all the Game of Thrones fans to make a revelation. What is it, Stephen? Well, I think it's an American crow. It doesn't sound like a raven to me. It's not deep enough. It's like it may be that they've taken, you know, a bit. But this often happens. You know, birders are often watching a television program and you hear completely the wrong bird calling or singing in the background. So I don't know why they haven't used the raven's call because it's incredible. But every, you get most other things right in Game of Thrones, to be fair. And the, that's a small spoiler the, here. Yeah, it's, uh, no, it's okay because everybody who's seen the Game of Thrones now needs to go back and listen to a real raven. You can they find do. It on they do. But the key thing about the, the Game of Thrones is the raven's about the only thing in it that doesn't die. <laughs> Two ravens are important not only to mythology, but also because the Great Britain, Mother Britain of America, uh, integrated with the Danes, with the Norsemen with the people who worshipped Odin. And the legend is that Odin had two ravens, Hugin and Munin. And every morning they performed a task for him. What was it, Steve? They would fly around the world and come back and tell him what they'd seen. They were his eyes and ears, which is why George Martin uses them. Of course, George R. R. Martin knows that story. And he's used the ravens as the all-seeing. You know, his ravens are, they see the past, the present and the future. Um, and he's based that very strongly on that um, original Viking myth. Now, the raven is a scavenger, like the bald eagle. And the scavenger means that battlefields and ravens go together. That is an, that's, and so do graveyards and ravens, because ravens will feed on corpses. That is part of their world. They're also, I learned from Stephen, regarded as tricksters and independence, completely independent. I take they don't travel in packs. Or is there such a thing as a flock of ravens? You do sometimes see groups of ravens. Generally, you see individuals or pairs or family groups of three or four. But absolutely, yeah, they are a very independent bird. And they're a bird that, that I suppose, for me, sums up the independence of birds. They sort of do what they want. They don't do what we want. And I love that about them. You have lots of lots of Shakespeare, lots of quotes in the book. It's all wonderful because here we are in the 21st century and birds have been part of our history, prehistory, thousands of years. Lady Macbeth, the raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. I never saw that line jump out at me until you quoted it, Stephen. Yeah, ravens in Shakespeare. Ravens are generally regarded by most societies and most civilizations in the past and the present as something rather um terrifying you know they're 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 they're, they're harbingers of doom if you like and of course the quote the raven nevermore in in poe but in some stories of the raven they're not some of the oldest stories of the raven they're 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 they've also got a sort of good side so and i think they're a bird that's been hugely persecuted particularly in britain from the 18th century onwards and when i was growing up i would have had to have traveled to wales or scotland or perhaps the very west of england to, to the wild places to see a raven and now i get them over my house i've seen them over london you know they are a bird that has come back so they're a very they're a really good success story they're very adaptable of course they were persecuted from the 17th to the 19th century the bounty was four pennies, which is substantial if you're poor. Yep. Why were they persecuted? Well, they, they killed them. They were persecuted. Well, and ravens were considered a good bird because, of course, they would have, in Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's time, they would have cleared up the bodies of mostly animals, but possibly people in London. You know, they were like the cleanup squad, the scavengers, like vultures have been around the world. But when sheep farming became much more lucrative and much more popular in Britain, ravens would come down and eat lambs or they'd kill sick lambs or whatever. So they suddenly turned from being a good bird to a bad bird, if you like, in our, in our view. And the fact that they would have been also seen on battlefields, as you say, when, you know, as soon as even before people were dead, they would have gone down and started, um, I'm afraid, you know, pecking their eyes out and things. 
So we have a very, very ambivalent relationship with ravens, but I think we need to rehabilitate them because they are glorious birds. And they're back in numbers in Britain, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, they're doing really well there. This is worth a trip just to see it. meet a raven. Uh, I'm speaking with Stephen Moss. He is a producer for BBC, but now the author of a new book, The 10 Birds That Changed the World, Peru, The Cormorant. The Cormorant's droppings turn into guano. And this story is so strange, I go immediately to Stephen Moss to help me tell it. The discovery of the guano on these islands, the arid islands, 50 meters deep. Uh, I put that all together with who who did, who did had the breakthrough? When did they have the breakthrough that it was fertilizer, Stephen? Well, actually, the Incas. So over a thousand years ago, the Inca civilization in South America knew about guano. Guano is very like all seabird um poo basically droppings it is very rich in phosphates and nitrates and it's very very good fertilizer but of course that had been forgotten with the end of the inca civilization and then in the 19th century a, a, a british businessman called william gibbs based in, in near where i live actually in bristol um he and his partners went over to peru and harvested this guano now the important thing here is that you mentioned the fact these were very arid islands uh, seabirds live in colonies all around the world. They live off North America, they live off Europe in colonies, but it rains in those places. And so the guano washes away. There's some left, but broadly it washes away. That didn't happen. So there were vast amounts of this guano there. He entered into a contract with the Peruvian government that he would pay them a fee. He would ship this horrible, malodorous, rather dangerous sub, sub, um, substance back to Britain. And then he sold it to farmers and he became the richest commoner in England, the richest non-aristocrat in England. He became, I, I compare him to someone like Bill Gates because he was also a great philanthropist um, with the money he earned. The only problem was that the money he'd earned was from guano, which was being harvested by these poor um Chinese indentured labourers, labourers that had been brought over from China, either thinking they were going to California to take part in the gold rush, or they'd just been fooled and, and, and captured and press ganged and brought by ships all the way to Peru across the Pacific Ocean, where they lived and died on these islands. Um, it's a really tragic story. And it means that the wonderful house just up the road from me, Tinsfield, which is a beautiful Victorian house built and and created by William Gibbs full of beautiful objects is built effectively on the lives of Chinese laborers so it's a very very tragic and horrible story they worked till they died they worked till they died yeah and when Peru like other countries like the United States and like Britain abolished slavery and they did so I think it was the 1860s because these men were not classified as slaves they weren't released the story so, gets the story moves from the persecution of chinese immigrants to the poisoning of the earth because yes. guano is a natural process um i loved it that alexander von humboldt noticed something was different in the lima fields i thought von humboldt i've read about you i didn't remember you you discovering guano but now we come to the revelation that you can artificially create fertilizer. I, I believe that the, I'm following your reporting, Stephen, 1840 to 1870 is the high point of guano. And then we come to high farming. Uh, two Germans, I believe, Haber and Bosch, what did they discover? What they did, what happened was there was a great demand as, as the, as the, the, trading guano fell off, partly because the Peruvians realized that they had this fantastic, um, resource so people stopped bringing guano to britain and by then farmers had depended on it they depended on having a fertilizer until then they'd never really had fertilizers so harbour and bosch in the early 20th century invented um synthetic phosphates and nitrates which then particularly after the second world war in britain and america kick-started what we call intensive or industrial farming or high farming where yields were 
artificially increased yields of crops in particular by spreading the land with fertilizers. Now that's fine and it's good because it feeds people and farmers need to do that. But unfortunately, it meant that farming became so intensive that particularly in Britain and Europe and North America, actually particularly in Britain really, um, a lot of farmland in Britain is pretty hopeless for wildlife. And we are losing a lot of our wild species, almost half our bird species are now threatened with disappearing in Britain now, the latest figures show. So, you know, guano was, it, it did a lot of good things. It created, you know, it stopped people starving by allowing more food to be produced, but we went too far. And that's the problem with that story. Yes, now I see the birds and the insects decline because of the chemical farming in Britain. That's why, the partridge in a pear tree. I've never seen a partridge. Do you still have them? We we do, but not very many. They're a bird that's declined hugely because they are a, very, a classic bird of lowland farmland in Britain. And along with many species, and it's happening in the United States with species like the bobolink, you know, species that, um, you know, birds that depend on farmland are declining. And that's because farming farming is too intensive. You know, we need to make room for wildlife. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a sad story. And, and again, as so many of these stories in, in 10 Birds That Changed the World are, it's a lesson we should have already learned. And yet we seem incapable of learning that, these lessons. The butterflies retreat, the beetles retreat, the gray partridges retreat, the skylarks retreat. And then there's this twist. Not until Silent Spring 1962 did we associate this with chemical and uh, chemical farming and at the same time soil degradation so the soil is less fertile now because it's been it's been treated as if it was a drug addict yeah and exactly. and and had to live since guano i mean guano wouldn't have hurt the fields it was the artificial that hurt the fields yeah, and I think the intensity of it, and and you're right, it is. That's a very good analogy. It is like a drug addict. Rachel Carson was so far ahead of her time. Of course, she was pilloried by the industrial farming um, establishment, if you like, in the United States. You know, and and tragically, of course, died of cancer very young before she saw that Silent Spring has become the sort of bible for environmentalists on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so that's another very sad story. And, and, you know, she deserves and gets, I think, huge um, praise for what she did. There's a twist here, too, Stephen. I'm writing my own plot here. But the Second War, following the First War, the Germans used submarine warfare to starve Britain. And you had to go to mass production of food. The U.S. had to provide mass production of food to supplement what the U.K. wasn't growing for itself. So our warfare, our politics, again, damaged the wildlife that we now mourn as has been damaged. We did it. Yeah, we did it for very good reason. You know, Britons were starving in the war. My mother and grandmother lived through the war and they would tell me about it. And it was horrendous. But the problem was after the war, when we could have right. reestablished farming as less intense effectively and still fed the population because by then of course we could then import food we stopped doing that and it's it's a tragedy on in britain and it's you know we're still suffering from it 10 birds that changed the world stephen moss is the author this next story took my breath away it's about something humble called the sparrow we have sparrows everywhere they they sing this is the tree sparrow and it's the tree sparrow of Asia, the tree sparrow of China, the People's Republic of China. In December of 1958, Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, declared four vermins must be wiped out, rodents, mosquitoes, flies, and the tree sparrow. What follows is astonishing. Stephen, I want to make sure rodents... Mosquitoes, flies, and sparrows, they're not the same thing. But uh, focusing on the sparrow, what kind of sparrow? What did it look like? 
It's very, uh, it's a bird actually found in Britain. We we are used to the house sparrow, which you, of course, have in the United States because it was brought there by mistake. Um, this is a close relative of that. It's not related to the American sparrows, really. It's a seed-eating bird. It was very common in China, in rural and urban areas. Now, what you have to remember about Chairman Mao is even compared to other dictators like Stalin and Hitler and, dare I say, certain former US presidents, um, one of the problems with Mao is that he had absolute power. I mean, all dictators are powerful, but he took it to a different level. So when he told 650 million Chinese people to go out and kill the sparrows because they were eating the grain, so he was hoping that by killing the sparrows, the harvest would be bigger, they'd lose less grain, which sounds quite logical. They obeyed him and they went out and did it. The problem he didn't understand, and he was told it very soon afterwards, but he chose to ignore it, was that sparrows, like a lot of seed eating birds, feed their youngsters, their chicks on insects. So the following year, when all the sparrows had been killed, there were no, and when we say sparrows, they pro people probably killed most small birds because they're not going to be starting to identify whether it's a sparrow or not. What happened was that the insects had a massive population boom and ate all the harvest. And uh, the, the figure is disputed, but it is potentially as many as 45 or 50 million Chinese people died in the following year or two from um, famine. That is more than died globally in the entire First World War. So this is the worst human created disaster in global history and yet as you said to me when we were chatting earlier most people don't know about this i did i didn't know and i read a great deal about the people's republic of china because of the threat here in the 21st century let me go through the logic here if, if i understand it the sparrows were not vermin they were just urbanized they live in the countryside, they live in the cities. The cities at this time were not dominant in the People's Republic of China. It was a rural population. They they lived and died with sparrows. The opinion of the Chinese peasants, the people who lived in the country was, you only eat sparrows during times of famine. Yes, There's I, the irony in all directions here, Stephen. Yeah, and I met, I had this extraordinary meeting, which I describe in the book, I met a half English, half Chinese woman called Esther Chow Ying, who was there in 1958-59 and worked for the English language radio station in uh, what is now Beijing, Peking. And she said, this is a stupid idea. We shouldn't kill the sparrows. It's going to end in tears. She was not quite the only person who said that, but one of the tiny minority. Esther still lives. I spoke to her grandson yesterday. Esther is still thriving at the age of 91, lives in North London, um, and is a, just a, a remarkable, delightful and extraordinary woman who basically contradicted Chairman Mao. And you did not do that. No. And she did, and she lived to tell the tale. And of course, as one of her colleagues said many years later, she said, I was right, wasn't I? And the colleague said, you were right, Esther, but at the wrong time, which is a very, you know, concerning comment because of course people contradict dictators they have doing it now in iran for example and they get arrested they get killed you know even though they're right and this is you know this is she she was extraordinary and she survived but many many millions of people did yes let's talk to two ornithologists who were at the peking national history museum they're the ones who were responsible for making this connection right away 1958, yes. they made it. Zhu uh, and Cheng, they were. Cheng is the founder of Chinese ornithology today. They yes. were at the academy, and they, uh, they had a sparrow stomach open, and they saw it was mostly insects. So they made the connection, and they took it to the authorities. Yeah, thinking the authorities would not just reward them, but would would understand how dangerous this was, and instead. I don't know. Were they pers? Yeah, they were persecuted. Yeah. They were yeah, they lost their jobs. They were sent to um, rehabilitation camps. You know, they they were treated appallingly, and and you know they did survive, and they did 
get through. But as you say, you know, this is what happens in dictatorships. This is what is happening, I'm afraid to say, in America now. And it's happening in Britain now that it's no use being right. We are saying to our government, you need to deal with the climate crisis. You are people are saying that in America. Since probably the majority of people in America and Britain think this. And yet governments, for whatever reason, don't want to hear. And that was Mao's problem. No one actually, of course, no one dared go to Mao and say, look, these two scientists have, have proved that we mustn't do this because they would have lost their jobs. You know, this is the problem with fear, problem with governments of fear. Um, I, also, I also read into this, Stephen, something else about the public, because once they were given this direction by Mao, they threw themselves into it with a fever that's not rational. Yes. You cited there was one young man who was rewarded in the newspapers because he'd strangled 20,000 sparrows. Yeah. That's nutty. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. And most of the birds weren't killed, actually, by shooting them or, or, or strangling them. They were mostly killed, particularly in cities, by people going around for two days and two nights bashing pots and pans and you know, blowing trumpets and making a noise. And the sparrows would fly up every time they found a flock of sparrows, and they're a very um, sociable bird, they would fly up in the air. And they literally, after two d days, they died. You know, they were exhausted. They fell to the ground in their thousands. Um, and it shows just how quick it is. This wasn't something that took six months or, or a week even. It was really a few days. And... Yeah, people like that man did that. and But the consequences, are, you know, it is right. heartrending to read. Um, I'm sorry, you know, people reading this book. There are some very positive stories in this book and there are some very positive outcomes. But that story, I think, is the best story in the book. And it's the one that, that is the most awful, really. Well, it is Maoism and Maoism hasn't left us, Stephen. So let's go to Australia again. Remember, everything is exotic and we'll try to kill you. Not the emu. What is an emu? The emu is basically the second or third largest bird in the world after the ostrich. It depends. It's taller than a cassowary, but not as heavy. So it's one of these big flightless birds, really big, you know, taller than as tall as a human being. 60 it's kilograms. Good heavens. Yeah. It can run 50 kilometers per hour. Yeah, it's a terrifying bird. And what happened was that emus live they're, they're nomadic because like a lot of creatures in Australia, they have to follow the rains. You know, food is not necessarily in the same place at the same time. And what happened in Western Australia, this is a sub story in the, in the tree sparrow story, partly for humour, actually, because it's a very funny story, that in the in the 1930s, a whole load of soldiers, Australian soldiers from the First World War who were on hard times, were given houses and land in Western Australia, in, effectively on the edge of the desert, so that you know they could be compensated and so that they would would you know start up a new um economy there and what happened was the emus came in one day big large numbers of this very sociable bird net all the crops so the australians sent the army in to kill them all with machine guns only it didn't work because the emus were very clever and they would split and they would you know it's almost like they were you know like a proper army does you know it uses tactics and strategy and the emus won the war. It's called the Emu Wars. It's the only example of a bird winning a war against human beings. And it's a it's a great story. It could Do the Australians be... admit to this, Stephen? When, when yeah, you... yeah, oh, they did. No, to be fair on the Australians, they did. I mean, there's a famous story that one of the MPs um, stood up and said, well, we do need, of course, we should be giving the soldiers, the human soldiers who fought in this war, medals, campaign medals, because you always get a medal, as you know, if you fight in a war. And another man stood up and said, if we're going to give any medals at all, let's give them to the emus because they won. It's a, it's a wonderful story. It's a way of it's a way of dealing with the foolishness of mankind when he when he when he examines the forest or the or the desert and says, maybe we can interfere. Maybe we can intervene. And exactly. the the intervention in China is the great leap forward that mass that mass murder was direct consequence of Mao intervening in Mother Nature. You report the next year, they imported 250,000 tree sparrows from the Soviet Union in order to reestablish the ecosystem. Extinction is the term. Climate crisis is upon us. Stephen Moss is the author. Ten birds that changed the world. We're turning next to the snowy egret and the emperor penguin. 
First, the snowy egret, a beautiful bird to look at photographs. And the plumage wars. This had to do with fashion, maybe from Marie Antoinette, but certainly by the 19th century in Europe and in America. Ladies' hats. Stephen, there's a part of the story that's hard to tell about the abuse of birds with beautiful plumes like the snowy egret. We've changed, Stephen. There's no toleration for this kind of cruelty today. Uh, I hope not. I mean, people still shoot birds, certainly in Europe and, uh, and America, you know. But what happened here was, that, as you say, this was driven by, I suppose, what you'd call posh rich women in New York, in Paris, in London. They wanted to outdo their friends, and they did so first by wearing ostrich feathers, which were farmed, so that was less of a problem. But then from feathers of wild birds and not just feathers, people would wear things like a hummingbird as a brooch on their, you know, a dead one on their on their dress. And the demand for feathers was huge. And of course, where there's demand, there's money to be made. And so men in Florida, ordinary men would go out and they would kill these birds like snow egrets that live that nest in big colonies. So you could go in with a boat and you could perhaps kill hundreds of birds in one go. And then they would sell perhaps for a dollar or two each pile of feathers. But those feathers were ultimately sold at prices equivalent to the same weight as gold. So this was a massive industry, huge industry. People were making big profits. And then one day, a young man called Guy Bradley, who'd been a, he'd helped the shooters himself when he was young. But in his, by his, I think his 20s, 30s, late 30s, he'd, become a warden, become a ranger um, in the early days, encouraged by people like Teddy Roosevelt, who was a remarkable um, conservationist in, in his own right, uh, as well as being president. And so Guy Bradley confronted uh, a man and his sons who were collecting the egrets. He caught them red-handed and they shot him. They shot him dead. And this became, this story from Florida, went up to New York, it went across to LA and San Francisco, it went to the, the big cities in America and caused outrage. And it eventually took another 20 years, but it led to the end of the plumage industry because people were so shocked by this. Simultaneously or in parallel, there's the development of what we in America call the Audubon Society, and what in Britain is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Although there was another found, founding group called the Fur Fur Fins and Feathers Folk. I love that one. That's uh, right, one yeah. They because, joined forces with the Society for the Protection of Birds to be, eventually become the Royal Society, as you say. But these were, again, what was great about this was these societies were, Audubon and RSPB, were, were started, founded, run, and promoted by women. And this was a time, certainly in the United Kingdom, where women did not have the vote for another 20 or 30 years. And I think the same is true in the United States. So these women were outraged by the cruelty of these poor birds dying in, in their millions. And that also the fact that they were going to eventually go extinct. And the snow egret nearly followed the, the dodo and the great auk and the passenger pigeon down that line. Um, so these women were very, very uh, determined and they started these societies that we are still members of and still love today. Yes, the, the American Audubon Society, National Audubon Society, is a product of those hats. And the hats went away when a an influencer, we say today, had her hair cut into a bob and the hats went away. That's I've often right. wondered about the hats. The hats that I've seen, I've, where did they come from? And I went and saw a picture of a woman dressed up at the turn of the century. And there was a snow egret feather right out of the top of her hat. Yeah. I, your book makes me see things I've always seen, but not understood, Stephen. So let's go now to a story of climate crisis. This has to do with the emperor penguin of the Arctics and how the expectation is 98% extinct by 2100. I think I think I get that. That That's nearly extinct. It's too much. That means they'll be doomed. And this is in Antarctica. Again, this the parallel with the dodo is incredible because the dodo, everyone thinks the dodo was stupid because it couldn't fly. But of course, it wasn't stupid in context. It had evolved for tens of thousands of years to live on an island where there were no predators. 
so it was fine. Now, the predator now is humanity, and we're not killing the emperor penguins. We're not going and shooting them or harvesting them, or, or we're not releasing rats or dogs into Antarctica. But what we are doing is by creating the climate crisis, and I'm glad you used that term. It's a term we try to use here now rather than climate change. We are leading a bird that is evolved to nest and breed in the Antarctic winter. You may well have seen it on David Attenborough documentaries on PBS and things. Um, this extraordinary bird that's been doing absolutely fine until now. It's still, there's still big numbers of emperor penguins. I saw one many years ago. I went all the way to Antarctica and saw one. But there are big colonies of them, but they are deeply threatened and they're not the only thing. Lots of birds that migrate through the eastern seaboard of the USA and Canada, um, lots of birds in Europe, particularly migrants, particularly birds that nest in the Arctic, where things are changing very rapidly, just as they are in the Antarctic, are massively under threat now. And it's a terrible cliche. We use the cliche in Britain, the miner's canary, because coal miners used to take a canary down the mine, because if the canary was sitting on its perch, if it fell off its perch, it was because there was gas that the canary would react to first and the miners knew they had to get out very quickly or they too would die. That is what this penguin is. You know, penguins and these other birds that I mentioned in the last chapter of 10 Birds That Changed the World are the equivalent of the miners' canary. And if we don't listen, we are doomed. The temperature changes are not just in the Antarctic or the Arctic. They're also on hillsides and cloud forests. And that very much affects birds that we have here in North America, you have in Europe. The warblers are damaged because their their insects move with the temperature. That's right. So birds, insects react rather more quickly than birds do. So migratory birds tend to come back at the same time every year, whether that's in North America or Europe, because they winter in the Southern Hemisphere. They wait till the day length changes which of course is constant that isn't changing because of the climate crisis and they head north but the trouble is by the time they get back to the eastern states of north america or the western states or europe or britain those insects have already been and gone you know that they've they've come out a month earlier and what we're doing is we're messing with um you know the biological world if you like in a way that we can't predict what the results will be but what we can predict is that a few species that are very adaptable like the raven will be fine but most species like the emperor penguin won't we have 30 seconds steve you have a Stephen. you have a concept called apocalypse fatigue what is that that's the idea that we have heard so much about climate change and it's so huge and so terrifying that we can't grasp it. I am an optimist. I have to be an optimist. And my optimism says that we will, at the 11th hour, we will realise that when we mess with birds, when we mess with wildlife, it bites us back. That's the, that's the theme of this book. That's what I've been trying to say. And thank you for being, you know, so in incisive and, in, you know, insightful into what I'm trying to say, the message I'm trying to get across. Got to meet a raven. I, before I move on, Stephen, I have to meet a raven. So well, you are very welcome to come over here and I will show you a raven. The bir 10 Birds That Changed the World. Stephen Moss is the author. I'm John Batchelor.